Good morning, everybody, and thank you for joining us today with, at the Global Reading Network for our workshop on the Enabling Writers Program. Um, before I, uh, we move on to introducing the speakers, I wanted to provide you a little background about this initiative. Um, the Enabling Writers Pro Workshop Program is funded by the All Children Reading a Grand Challenge for Development Partners, which include USAID, World Vision, and the Australian Government, and is supported by University Research Company and still lead through training, mentoring, and monitoring processes. Uh, the workshop program was officially launched in November 2016. It was conceived, conceived as a proof of concept, an effort to uh, develop a model that would uh, support um, communities in, in developing substantial sets of high quality decodable and leveled books for adoption by ministries of education and used by schools in developing countries. Uh, to develop the local capacity for sustainable creation of those books beyond the scope of the funded project and to produce a large set of quality books using the Bloom Book Writing software for sharing via the Global Digital Library and other online ebook access points. Um, our team today is going to talk a little bit about, uh, from Nigeria today, is going to talk a bit about their experience. Uh, uh, equipping workshop facilitators with materials, software, and processes to engage local groups of writers to work together to create book titles. And they're going to tell a bit about their experience working with Phil International's Bloom Book Writing Software, which was the winner of ACR GH GCD's 2015 Enabling Writers Competition. Um, all books are written within the local language context, and they align with specific curricular standards for literacy acquisition and contact knowledge. Contact knowledge. And our teams engage local ministries in their implementation and book development. Um, the Enabling Writers Workshop Program uh, contributes to meeting two of the Global Book Alliance objectives, to produce well-written, level-appropriate mother tongue reading materials, and to expand access to content by providing open license, downloadable materials that allow sharing, electronic use, and large-scale printing. Uh, so I'm going to move on to our team member, Aristeric Limo, from the REACH team at URC, to uh, introduce our, our panelists and to, to tell you a little bit more about uh, their background, and uh, we'll proceed with the program. Thank you, Jennifer. Uh, as Jennifer mentioned, today's webinar will focus on the, will spotlight the Nigerian Enabling Writers Workshop Program responsible for creating a uh, decodable and supportable book in the uh, language. So, Today, we, we, we have four presenters, but we will have three presenters online. Our first presenter is Auduliman, who is actually the Nigeria Enabling Writers Project Manager, but he also he works at the Article Center and holding the position of Administrator of Grants and the Contracts. Auduliman brings over 20 years of project design and implementation experience as well as a country office leadership for Open Connect and Jajin. Our second presenter is Grace Malui. Dr. Grace Malui Malui is a lecturer at the American University of Nigeria, where she teaches writing and coordinates literacy related community development service learning courses. She serves as curriculum and pedagogy lead. Uh, on Enabling Writers Project in Nigeria. Dr. Grace and Adulman, you are welcome for this webinar. Thank you. Another presenter, our third presenter will be <laughs> Professor Salis Ahmed Yakasai. Professor Salis Yakasai is a lecturer in the Department of Nigerian Languages at the Usman Danfordio University and is currently the National Vice President of the Nigerian Institute of Translators and Interpreters. Our fourth presentation will be coming from Dr. Gaba Gandu. He is a NEDIC representative. Uh, NEDIC is Nigerian Educational Research Development Council. and. Uh, Dr. Gandu is the Deputy Director, Language Research and Development 
and a focal person in reading initiative and policy framework. He'll be, he will not be available online with us, but his presentation will be presented by Professor Salus on behalf of him. So we will start hearing from Audu Liman, then to Dr. Grace, then Professor Salus. So Audu Liman, please, you're welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone online and uh, on phone. All right, we are delighted to be able to uh, participate in this webinar, the American University of Nigeria uh, development mission includes uh, providing access to education for particularly children affected by conflicts and uh, uh, children uh, not able to have access to education for any other reason. So we are situated in northeastern Nigeria, actually this, the second uh, most affected state in terms of the Boko Haram insurgency is Adamawa State, and we are situated in the capital city of Adamawa State. Prior to our engagement with the uh, URC USAID project, we had been implementing a USAID uh, technology enhanced learning program, which was a radio program that broadcast radio sessions, radio lessons, literacy in Hausa uh, uh, to teach uh, reading, literacy and numeracy for using the Hausa language. So we got this, when this opportunity came with uh, Read to Reach, competition, we're delighted to join that because already as part of university uh, community outreach, we have been working with Dr. Grace and her team and our students have been developing actually supplementary readers in Hausa and another language here called Fufude that we have been using in, in other programs that we run, but also sharing with uh, schools that are close, what we call host, host community primary schools, we've been using it to help them. So when this opportunity came, to the natural match for our own uh, vision and mission, and therefore we applied to be the, the key implementer to develop 200 readers, decodable readers, uh, leveled readers in Hausa language as the primary deliverable for the engagement we had with we have with URC. Uh, over the course of the initially nine months, it's, it's stretched to more than nine months because of, uh, I guess, contractual issues. But we're delighted that uh, as at uh, October, end of October, the first batch of all the books, all 200 readers, were presented to the federal government of Nigeria, represented by Na the Ministry of Federal Ministry of Education, who were in attendance, uh, the Nigerian Educational Research Development Center, which is the body mandated to approve all curriculum materials in Nigeria, as well as USAID Nigeria and other partners who work with us. The, Singular thing I wanted to mention here in terms of uh, something we did, uh, we did very, very well, I would say, be, be beyond the, the, uh, developing the books, is the strategic partnership we were able to obtain working with projects, USAID projects, uh, DFID projects, UNICEF projects, that are all, all of them were also doing primary education, promoting reading, and we work with uh, NEI Plus, Northern Education Initiative, funded by USAID, we work with them to kind of complement, strategize and, uh, and leverage the resources that we have. We work with another project here called RANA, Reading Access Nigerian Activity, funded by, uh, funded by I think it's UNICEF through uh, DFID, also doing reading across Nigeria in Hausa language. So those two projects particularly were very, very helpful to us in terms of getting technical support for, re for writers that joined us in terms of getting illustrators, but also in terms of piloting and testing the books that we had developed in the Hausa speaking areas of uh, Nigeria uh, that those projects uh, operate. So I'm really delighted uh, and on behalf of the American University of Nigeria, I want to thank USAID in particular and URC specifically for the confidence they had in our ability to do this. And we look forward to more uh, engagement as we promote the use of these books in primary schools in Nigeria. Thank you. Thank you, man, for such a great, great introduction. And now, I think um, Dr. Grace to present the remaining part. Dr. Grace, you're welcome. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, as uh, 
As Dr. Neman said, we are really delighted to, um, to have been part of this project. Uh, the Nigerian experience has been fun for us. So what we're going to share will be the lessons learned from a structured level and decodable uh, book writing program using the Bloom software. Now, when we started this project, we had um, a task assigned to us as per the contract that we were given to develop high quality books in Hausa that support reading instruction. And I think the key word there is books that support reading instruction. So our target was to develop 50 decodables and the decodable single, simple single word books with short sentences that can help beginning readers to, uh, to, um, to improve on their reading and then 150 leveled books. And then those texts were grouped increasingly according to difficulty uh, level. And the books were also, were supposed to develop the books in such a way as they depict the cultural context of the lives of the children and that's why the, the writers were local and then to develop the capacity of these local writers as well, to be able to use the Bloom software so that creating a kind of sustainability for the, for the project even outside, even after the expiration of the contract, and then to secure buy-in of relevant government establishments. So that was the task where we're contracted to do. And then the books are supposed to be developed in Hausa. Now Hausa is one of the three major uh, languages in Nigeria. So developing books in Hausa goes a long way in helping the, in advancing reading in Nigeria since Hausa is one of the major languages in the country. So our first task on this, uh, on the project was putting together the, putting together the guiding documents. Slide, yes, second. Third slide. So putting together the, the guiding documents. Now the, we require two major guiding documents to enable seal lead to set up the Bloom, the House of Bloom, uh, to give us a House of Bloom setup that can be used to produce these structured, uh, structured books. So our first guiding document uh, is the House of Phonics Scope and Sequence. The second guiding document we had to develop was the leveling document that used to, uh, to ensure that the leveled books were according to levels of difficulty and we, did, we needed to get sample texts in Hausa that were representative of the words and then the kind of sentences that were appropriate to the level of the, of the children. So that was our first task. And so we, needed, we, we felt there was no need to reinvent the wheel. So what we did was to go to um, agencies and organizations that have worked in that are also engaged in development of house literacy materials to see if we can source these um, guiding documents. So our first outing on this project took us to the Nigerian Educational Research and Development Council. So right from the onset of the program, we got involved with our stakeholders and we went to the Nigerian Educational Research and Development Council because that's the agency that is charged of book development and curriculum development. So we went, them, we went to them to see if we can get a phonics, house of phonics scope and sequence. And then if there were guiding documents, uh, leveling documents we could use to, uh, to enable us uh, give seal lead for the Bloom setup. Now our visit to NEI Plus, uh, to NERDC, we met with the executive secretary and we shared the, the goal of the project with them. They were excited about it and so they, they put us in contact with the Northern Education Initiative Plus because they've worked with them and they were in the process, they, were, they, ha they had developed course materials for Hausa, but specifically textbooks. And then we were put in contact again with um, Reading and Numeracy Activity RANA, which is a UNICEF project uh, implemented by FHI 360. So we had a meeting with this, at the onset of the project, we had a meeting with these three bodies, NERDC, Northern Education Initiative Plus, and Reading and Numeracy Activity in Abuja. And then from our interaction, we were able to come up with this three, uh, this guiding documents that we needed. So the, the uh, House of Phonics Scope and Sequence that we used in developing our materials 
were adapted from the scope and sequence that is used in NEI plus Hausa textbooks. The leveling document was an adaptation of samples sent to us by the by URC plus the the things the leveling document some uh, bits of information in the NEI plus textbook that kind of suggests some kind of leveling. And so these things were adopted, were adapted to, pro to produce the leveling document that was used on this project. And then the sample text, for sample text, AUN had been, as um, Liman said, AUN has been, in the, uh, has been engaged in developing household literacy materials since 2012 and under the project called Teller. And then we used those materials. We, uh, we took samples from those materials and then samples from any plus textbooks and then the read aloud storybooks that were produced by Rana. So that was how we were able to generate the sample text that were appropriate to the level of um, to the level required for us to, to write the books for grade one and two on EW on the EW uh, project. Now our next task, when we had assembled the guiding documents and sent them to uh, to the field lead to, to give us the blooms um, to, to set up the set up bloom to be used for developing the materials, our next task was to assemble our writers. So what we did with assembling of our writers was to to get writers that were already engaged in developing house early grade reading materials, and so. We invited writers that had worked with NEI Plus in developing their um, household literacy materials, and then we worked with also writers who had worked with uh, on RANA reading and numeracy activity because they had developed read aloud text in Hausa, and so we invited the writers from these two projects. We also invited um, Hausa language teachers who are trainers of. Um, primary and secondary school teachers in the colleges of education. We also invited writers who work with children in community libraries. We also invited uh, primary school teachers who had participated in our own uh, teller project and so have been engaged uh, in helping, literacy, helping children develop literacy and numeracy. And then as part of the writing team, NARDC sent us two house language um, consultants and so this was how we assembled the, the writers that came in for our first uh, writing workshop. So when we had assembled our writers we had our first writing workshop. In total to generate the to develop the 200 books we had in total three workshops. One was held three writing workshops. The first was held in February, the second was held in March and the third was held in, in May. Now the the first writing workshop was a five day workshop, Monday to Friday, and we invited thirty seven writers. We had three uh, uh, we had three people who came in as observers. Now that writing workshop lasted um, five days, and we were able to write one hundred and sixteen books, and then. Uh, but out of those books, pre-review we had 116, post-review we ended up with 95 books and because we had to discard uh, 21 books and I think the reason behind that was the fact that this writing workshop, we did many things in this workshop because that was the workshop that we used to lay the foundation in terms of what is uh, early grade reading, we had to acquaint the writers with early grade reading. The, what are leveled books, what are decodable books, and then they had to learn how to use the um, how to use Bloom. So there were a lot of things happening in that uh, workshop. And then we also uh, had um, the number of writers that we had. It was from that first workshop we realized that seven writers for for one writing trainer was a bit large. So our subsequent workshops we kind of cut down on that number. So the lesson we learned from that one workshop, from that first workshop, was that there was a need to conference regularly with the writers if we needed to produce books that would meet set standards. And then we also needed to uh, review with the writers the 
story structure so that they get an understanding of the fact that a story has to have some kind of exposition, a high point, and then some kind of uh, resolution of an issue. So we, those are things that we, those are lessons we learned from the first workshop, and then we implemented that in the second workshop. And we also learned that from the workshop, we realized books that were written in pairs or groups tended to be better than books that uh, writers wrote on their own. So when we had our second and third workshop, we made sure that these lessons learned helped us to have to produce better books. So our second workshop. So this was the focus of the first workshop, and so many things were happening. There was training on Bloom. There was enlightening them on the on decodable books. There was guiding them on how to even type decodable and level books on Bloom, making them understand the leveling and guiding documents. So a lot of things happened in that first workshop. Although we had a large number of books, but the quality, as I said, 21 was a large number to discard. So our second workshop, we invited 10 writers. So we moved from 37, limited it to 10 writers. And we selected our 10 writers based on the, on the quality of books that were written in the first workshop. So these 10 writers were the writers and co-authors of the 95 books that were selected. And from this, uh, from this, uh, at this workshop, what we focused on was one, reviewing some of the books from the from workshop one. We reviewed some of the books from from the first workshop, and then we tried to, in, to incorporate topics from core curricular subjects that were not adequately addressed in the in the first workshop. Because as part of our, of our deliverables, we had to produce informational text as well as narrative text. So first workshop, we didn't focus on informational text. So we focused on that in workshop two, and then. There were some themes that were not adequately addressed in workshop one, like peace, conflict re resolution, responsibility, local folktales. So these were things that we focused on in the second um, in the second workshop. Now our third workshop had even a smaller number of writers, and this workshop was just three days because we we had less than forty books to meet our target. So we invited six writers, and it ran for three days. And at that workshop, we were able to develop 38 leveled books. So, and we focused also on themes that were not sufficiently addressed from previous uh, workshops. So our focus were topics from co-curricular subjects, so more of informational text, and then um, writing uh, stories that were based on local folk tales. So that was the focus of workshop three. Now, so we organized the activities because, as I said, after our first workshop, we realized working in pairs and then um, organizing the, uh, the, the writers so that we can have high quality books was key and the ability to conference with them. So what we did with this workshop, we had a task sheet for every writing session. And our task sheets were designed in such a way that we specified what theme we want the writers to, to, to work on, or what curriculum content we wanted them to write on. So we put them in groups and we say, okay, you write a story that um, on the theme of maybe peaceful coexistence, and you're writing that story for, a level, for level four. Or you write a story that, that on the theme of conflict resolution, and you're writing that story for level three. Or we give them a textbook, a basic, maybe a basic science technology textbook, maybe book two, and we say pick a topic from the textbook and write a leveled book for level four, level three, or level two, depending on, because we wanted to make sure we had a uh, storybook balance across all the, all the levels. So we assigned specific tasks to the, to the writers, and by so doing, we're able to conference with them and make sure that the materials, the books being developed were of high quality and met the standards that had been set. So at, at the end of every workshop, we had a rigorous uh, review for quality assurance, review of the books for quality assurance. So we did quality assurance review at three stages. The first stage of our quality assurance review was, was done by our 
monitoring and evaluation team. And then that team consisted of the, M, the monitoring and evaluation lead who worked with a Hausa native speaker. And the Hausa native speaker um, is an intern with our project office. So our M and E lead worked closely with the Hausa native speakers to review the to, for the first stage in review of the of the books written at every workshop. Now they worked with hard copies. So at the end of the workshop, we printed the books that were written, and then the M E the M and E lead worked with the Hausa native speaker to review the books. And basically, they worked on the forms given to us as part of the contract for to be filled by the writers. So we reviewed. Um, we had checklists to review in terms of um, content, in terms of context, in terms of equity, in terms of gender and inclusion focuses. So some of those elements that were included in, in our contract, those were the things that the uh, M&E team focused on in the first stage of quality assurance review. Our second stage of quality assurance review is the writer, uh, writer trainer review. Now the writer trainer review and the editing was led by the writing trainer and pedagogy lead. For the for books written in the first workshop, the books were brought to the second workshop, and then the the writers helped in reviewing those books as they were writing the books for the second workshop. And this was done mostly on Bloom because the writers reviewed hard copy, but the writing trainer and the EW project staff did the uh, did the review on Bloom so that we're revising the booms the books on Bloom. Now the main focus of this revision was to follow up on things that were highlighted by the M and E review to carry out level checks. So we had to make sure the sentences, the the um, the the, uh, the number of words were in accordance with the the guidelines for that particular level on Bloom. And then we had to make sure that narrative and non-fiction organization, um, uh, organization structure was being followed in the books. And then we looked at content quality in terms of if it's a story, most of the, the word we normally use is it's a flat story. That's a story that just flat. There is no high point in it. There is no resolution in it. So we check that. And then we check for picture and page layout to make sure picture and page layout is balanced, and then we edited for basic errors of mechanics, the ones that we could um, we could easily see, like full stop and punctuation, those were things that we were able to edit of quality review, which is by the language expert. Now, our Hausa language expert, one of whom is Professor uh, Salusia Kase, who will be speaking later on. We had two of them, Professor Salusia Kase, and Professor Yelwa. They were our Hausa, they are Hausa language expert on this project. Both were, were recommended to us by the Nigerian Education Research and Development Council because of their, their expertise in terms of literacy and mater development materials specifically in Hausa and the fact that we needed to make sure that the, the Hausa used in the books was the standard Hausa that could cut across any region in, in Nigeria, and they were the best people to do that. So they reviewed hard copies, and those, so those hard copies were sent to them, and they edited errors in mechanics, accept, ensure that the Hausa used was acceptable standard Hausa in terms of structure and vocabulary. So that's how our book development um, activities went from assembling of our writers, the workshop, and then at the end of the workshop, we did the review. So these are the lessons we learned from that, um, from the activities. The need to maintain a 10 or less writer ratio for one writing trainer is important if um, the quality of book development is to be enhanced. Secondly, we realized that conferencing with writers during the writing process and reviewing the books with writers soon after the task is completed ensures the books meet set standards. So these are lessons we learned in the first workshop. And we implemented them in our subsequent workshops. And then in our first workshop, we had Bloom and the Hausa share or the Hausa setup on flash drives, and we gave, we gave each particip participant a prepared flash drive so that it made it easy 
to install the the Bloom software on the laptops of our of our writers without any risk of uh, computer virus transfer. We also realized that we needed a systematic review process to ensure book quality, and that was why we did the three stages of review, M&E review, the writer trainer uh, review, and then the, the house of language expert review. So we went through all those three, three stages for each book that was written. And we also realized that some of the writers needed refresher lessons on elements of a good story so that we could boost the, the quality of the narratives that were written on the, on the project. Now, after the, um, when we had um, written our 200 books, the next stage for us was the field testing. So the field testing took place uh, between the 10th and the 28th of uh, July 2017, but it was um, preceded by um, a field test training and distribution of the field testing kit. So that was done. We had a one-day training for the teachers that were going to participate in our that were going to participate in the field testing. So we had 20 teachers and two directors of quality of two directors of quality assurance from two states. The states we used for the field testing are Sokoto and Bauchi states. We we did field testing in, do, in these two states for for the reason that we needed to do field testing in places where the teachers were already familiar with. Um, teaching literacy in, in Hausa, and we're also familiar with the basic steps in, in terms of phonics, Hausa phonics, and we're also familiar with, um, with leveled materials. So we chose schools that were already in partnership with NEI+, Plus, which is the Northern Education, uh, Northern Education Initiative. So we chose five schools. The the sample, we, we took 25% of our sample, which were 50 books, and this, this is the distribution, decodables and um, levels chosen proportionally so that we could make sure that we were testing samples across, uh, across levels. Now, the purpose of the field testing was to find out whether the levels of text are appropriate for the students they were written for. We needed also the teacher's opinions about the books we also needed people's opinions about the books and whether the books were interesting and engaging. And then the field testing was also to help us with the next stage of, uh, of revision so that um, to enhance the quality and make sure that the, the input from teachers and pupils were taken care of when the final version of the books are, are released. Now the field testing process went something like this. At these are regulations given to us uh, in the documents supplied by uh, URC. So the teachers used one book for two days. They had to go through the process of they introduce the book to the students and they do it first and foremost as a read aloud. So they read aloud the books to the, to the, to the students. So this, these were things we, we trained them on. We told them we trained them on the procedure for the field testing. and so. They implemented that as per the procedure that was given to them. So read aloud first, then use the books following your regular classroom instructions. And we, we had a discussion with them regarding what do they normally do if they were reading, um, if they are reading a story in class. And we told them to do just exactly that with the, with the books that we give them. And then the last part of the training was to make sure that they gave the children the opportunity to do independent reading of the, of the books. So this was followed because each teacher had five different titles, and the teacher had to do uh, had to uh, go through the pro the process for each of the five books. And at the end of each uh, book, the teacher needed to complete uh, a data form that is included that was included in the pack that was given to them at the end of the field training. Now our field test monitoring was done by the Directors of Quality Assurance. These are, um, these are government officials who are in charge of quality assurance in the State Universal Basic Education Board. The State Universal Basic Education Board is the agency in charge of um, basic education in the state. So the quality assurance of directors are the ones that ensure quality 
in terms of curriculum materials, in terms of instruction in their schools. So they came to our field test training, and so they were the ones that served on the field for us as independent um, observers. And then our M and E team also monitored all schools, and then collected the forms that were completed by the independent observers, and also did um, followed up in 25% of the schools. So they observed teachers using the field test books during instruction. They also interviewed teachers about the books tested and then did a focused group interview for the, for the students to get the opinion of the students. Now the feedback from, from the students showed that the, the children liked all the books that were field tested. We didn't get any adverse report on any specific book. Now, what, we observed, what um, the report showed us was, was that each child would have liked to have a copy of the book during the, the lesson. But as per the instructions in the, um, given to us in the document, we printed only 10 copies of each title for the, for the children. So 10, 10, title, 10 copies of a title was not sufficient for all the children that in the class where the, the field testing was going on. So we had that feedback. And then we also noticed that children preferred, had a preference for books with animal characters. Uh, we also, from the feedback, we also found out that some words were not familiar to the children. And we realized that this was due to the fact that um, there are several varieties of Hausa. And this, the, the variety that was edited in our book is the standard uh, variety. So, Somewhere in Bauchi, some words might be unfamiliar because it's a different variety of Hausa. So for our books, we use the standard Hausa variety. And then we found out that some illustration did not support uh, the children to enable them to comprehend the, the text. So those were observations from the students. Now, these are the lessons we learned from the field testing. We found out that the, the involvement of the directors of quality assurance from the State Universal Basic Education of the two states that participated in our field testing had um, affected greatly the success of our field testing. Because this, the directors of quality assurance are the bosses of these teachers. And so the fact that these people were at the field test training with the teachers helped me, um, to get a full commitment from the, from the teachers that were involved in the field testing. It also gave the, the, the teachers the cooperation of their head teachers because the head teachers were not invited to the field testing uh, training. But since the director of quality assurance was there and the director of quality assurance is also the boss of the head teacher, we found out that there was cooperation from the head teachers as well. And then the fact that the director of quality assurance, who is the, the person in charge of curriculum and um, material development in the, and quality in the state, uh, Universal Basic Education Board got the, the boards interested in the work of the Enabling Writers Project. And it also ensured that we had someone who was monitoring daily the activities that was going on on the, on the field during the, test, uh, the field testing process. Now one thing we learned also was the fact that there is this desire by these students to get hard copy of books. To read, to, to use for independent reading, and so the need to produce these books for the for use by the children was something we learned from the field testing. Now, so after the field testing, one of the uh, purposes of the field testing was to get uh, input for review of the of the books that were written. So the main area of review that came about from the field testing had to do with illustration. So one of the uh, feedback was the fact that some of the pictures were not supporting comprehension on some pages. So we had to review illustration in two ways. We review illustration by combining two or more images to support the content. And then we partnered with a stakeholder to provide a complete illustration of 25 of our future decodables. So we have 25 um, decodables that are illustrated not with still images, but by, um, by an illustrator 
that gave us culturally appropriate illustration that supported the actions that were going on in, on each page. So this is a sample of the illustration review that we did. Like what it means is Nana Kichimasa, that is Nana eat something. So the, the, the picture with the girl and the woman separate is the best that we could get from seal illustration. So we, even to get that picture, we, we needed to combine two seal images to get something that suggests that there is a girl and there is something to be eaten. But with the illustration made by our stakeholder, you could see the girl and you could see her eating something on a plate. So that was uh, that uh, supported comprehension more than the picture on the is it the left or the right? The picture with the, with the two separate pictures. <laughs> okay. Now, so after our field review, after our field testing, we reviewed our materials. As I said, our main focus of illust uh, review was uh, illustration. So after the review, we produced the, our first our first batch of all 200 books, and we called a stakeholder meeting to adopt the books. And that was held on the 18th of um, October. We had the following agencies in attendance. The highest body with, uh, in charge of education in Nigeria sent a representative. Then we had the chief executive of the Nigerian Education Research Council, Research Development Council in attendance in person. We had the highest, um, the chief executive of the Ministry of Education in Sokoto State, who is the commissioner, was in attendance. And then we had the the heads of the three basic education boards of Sokoto, Boucher, and Adamao State in attendance. And the USAID was represented, British Council was represented, and then our two uh, partnering agencies from the RANA project and from the Northern Education Initiative Plus were also in attendance. So the lessons learned from the uh, from the project is the fact that we started off by getting in touch with the, the primary um, agency in charge of curriculum development and book development. And I think that, that kind of got us involved with the government agencies right from the start of the, of the project. And that has helped because we started with them, we've maintained that relationship up to the end of the of the project, and that is why we're having, even for this presentation, um, a representative from NERGC sending in their response to this project. So that's uh, something that we have learned. Involving relevant government agencies from the start of the project is key to material acceptance. And not just material acceptance, but even guidance on the direction to go with the project, because we got guidance from NERGC in terms of who to contact when we're looking for a specific uh, document. We also realized that collaboration with agencies and organizations involved in similar projects saves time and then improves your, your product because there will be no need for you to reinvent something that is already in existence and that was why we, found we, we didn't have to do too much work on coming up with the phonic scope and sequence. We just used what was available that is being used by any, uh, by any I+. So uh, the challenges. I think one of the uh, challenges with the project is writing is something that comes from inspiration. And so at a certain point in the workshops, we tend to see that inspiration is waning, especially towards the end of the day or maybe on the third, for a five-day workshop, maybe on the third or fourth day, you find out that the, the uh, stories are not coming out or books are not coming out the way you want them to come out. So that's a challenge. And then another ch uh, challenge we've, we encountered was working on the same Bloom folder for the review and quality assurance uh, process. Because if, if you're not working on the same Bloom folder, there's a tendency that a book has been reviewed in one folder and it's all reviewed in another folder. So there's the need to make sure that you're working on the same folder so that you don't have different versions of the book in different places. So that was a challenge as well. And then we had a challenge with writers who had mastered Bloom and were playing around with it. And so when we copied their 
their Bloom folder for us to do the review, find out that they've made the pages uneditable, and so we have to kind of rewrite the, the books because we can't edit on their, on their pages. So our recommendation for similar future projects is to find ways of increasing motivation. And what has worked for us is planning the writing tasks, planning the, having these uh, writing task sheets turned out to be really, really useful, and then specifying themes, and then giving them the scenario that you want to be developed in the, in the story. So there was a lot of discussion. Once, as, once, a ta sample task, once a task sheet is given to the writers, what we did was to talk about the, the theme, talk about possible scenarios. So all these things helped in uh, increasing motivation. And then, as I said, writing books written in groups or pairs were better than for us, we found they were better than books written in groups. So, because I think exchanging of ideas helps to increase motivation and inspiration. Another thing we did was to punctuate writing sessions with 10 to 15 minutes of fun activities. So we had the brain teasers were something that kind of refreshed our writers when we see that uh, motivation and uh, inspiration was waning. And then what we did also was to have uh, one computer designated for review with a hard drive. So that if a project staff reviewed a book and then the writing trainer needed to, to see that the review was made, all we needed to do was to get the hard drive or to work on that same computer. So this ensured that we didn't have uh, revisions done in different places, and then we get to, we lose track of which is the revised version and so on. So those, those things helped us to be able to overcome some of the challenges that were mentioned. Okay, thank you for listening. Oh, thank you, Dr. Grace and Liman for your wonderful presentation. As I mentioned before, uh, before we proceed with another presentation, we will have a few questions from participants to Dr. Grace and Liman. And Grace, if you can go to the question and answers box to see what questions have come from to, to into there. Uh, I can see here we have one question from Maxine asking how was tone in terms of vowel that is, vowel have different tones taken into account when determining the vowel difficult of a book, or is it is is it tone quite pro, uh, predictable and therefore not problematic? Uh, what we did with uh, with uh, tone and uh, in terms of difficulty level was basically the the um, we're more concerned with the fact that the the words, the, 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 the words met our criteria in terms of syllables. And so tone, uh, different tones in, in house that didn't push, pose too much uh, concern for us. What we tried to do was not to have um, two, um, a word that can pro be pronounced in two different ways within the same sentence and within the, on the same page. So that was what we tried to do so that we don't have um, a word spelled the same way, pronounced differently due to tone on the same page for the for the learners. So we took care of that so that um, the students are not confused in terms of this is the, this word is spelled the same way but is pronounced differently. Okay, there is another question there. It's asking, of course, they are saying saying thank you for your presentation, Dr. Margui. How did you manage? pay or con contracts for the writers? I think I'll allow the, <laughs> the grant administrator to answer that. Well, I, I think it, the, is the kind of advantage we have is we have a, a series of, uh, I mean, we're university, so we have access to a lot of students, both undergraduate and graduate. And the university systems allows for what we call work study, which pays a small stipend to students, but also we take in a lot of volunteers for many of our projects who are outside the university. So we have a predetermined pre rate, which was really very uh, uh, cost-effective for us in terms of 
the pain for time. But also, one last bit was um, almost, I would say, almost everybody who came to do the writing did not require a pay. What we did was we pay a stipend and cover their travel and provided accommodation. So we just incentivized them. We didn't pay like like a salary or a, a contract, really, except for the cost staff. Thank you, Liman, for such a, uh, a brief answer. Uh, that question asks, can you give more background on the education situation of minorities of Nigeria? Are they educated in the mother tongue at all? Are the children going to use these books at home or in school? Okay, let me answer the question that talked about how long was the second workshop. The second workshop was also uh, five days. So we had a first workshop that was five days, a second workshop five days, so the third workshop that was three days. Now regarding the background on the educational situation of minorities in, in Nigeria, I'm not sure what the person means by minorities, but what happens in this, um, Nigeria has an educational language policy and the language policy is that children are taught in the first three years of the primary school using the, um, the mother tongue or the language of, uh, uh, of wider communication as the medium of um, instruction. Now, when we do, uh, what we did with these materials is we, we, we field tested them in two states where Hausa literacy is actually being, being um, advanced and those states are Bauchi and Sokoto states. So for those schools, for these states where household literacy is being advanced, we find out that these children are going to use these books in school, and then if we're able to get them copies, they can use them at home for independent reading as well. Thank you. Can you proceed if we see another question, or should I read okay, there's, a, there's a question that says, did you include comprehension questions in the books? If not, why not? Now, when we were developing the books, I think that was something we talked about during the, the training, when URC was training us, whether there was a need to include comprehension questions in, in the books. And it was agreed we should just leave that, um, we should leave our comprehension questions and then allow the teachers to use the books the best way they, they, they can, using it according to their classroom, um, the, their already existing classroom practice. Okay. And there's a question from Richard Jones that it would be interesting to see the leveling document and how the phonics and sequence. Is it possible for you to share this? So I don't know whether it's Limo should answer that. Yeah, it's, it's up to our property. We can. Okay. You need to respond. I will share in terms of the, the materials are available. If anyone wants, I, I, I'm sure we can share that. Yeah. Okay. I'm sure we can share the phonic sequence and then the uh, leveling document, the house leveling document. Yes, we can. And then which Creative Commons did we use? We used Creative Commons 4.0 for the, uh, the books having uh, licensed under Creative Commons 4.0. And someone is asking if we can have the presentation to download. <laughs> yes, that, that will be available. I can answer that. That will be available uh, uh, after the end of this webinar. Maybe next two days it will be ready in GRN website. Okay. So I think that answers also the next question. Are the stories available electronically? So we're in the process of um, getting that available. I don't know whether Limo will answer that. Yes, I can. They will be available electronically, uh, and uh, they will be available in the global digital library and also Bloom library. But also, we are finding we are coordinating with other online libraries to see if we they can also uh, upload them in the library. So they will be available uh, globally. Okay. Now we have a question that says, "How do you think?" about Bloom Software, any improvement you think Bloom Software can, can do. In terms of the purpose that we used Bloom for in developing these Hausa uh, materials, making sure that they, 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 they are decodable, meeting the, the decodable level and meeting the level um, criteria, 
the Bloom software has worked excellently well in that. I think the only improvement might be illustrations, <laughs> and then. Yes. Yes. So. Uh, okay. And then I think that we have another point regarding the Bloom, the issue of collaboration when authors want to work on the same on the same book. Yeah. So that's something that could be improved upon. So thank you very much, Dr. Andres, for answering those questions. The questions which will not be answered online here will be posted in the GRIN's website with their answers. So let me take this opportunity to welcome Professor Salus. Uh, to do his presentation. And as I mentioned before, Professor Salus will do two presentations. Uh, one talking about his own experience working with uh, enabling writers since he was a consultant appointed by NEDIC. And also he will do another presentation from uh, NEDIC on behalf of the NEDIC director because he could not join us online today. Professor Salus, please, you are welcome. I will be talking about two things. One, the lessons learned from the implementation process, and then the recommendations for application. But before then, I would like to say something very little as a consultant of this program. Uh, as a consultant, my work includes reviewing and editing of the recordable and other story books. And when we talk about reviewing and editing, it involves checking the language, orthography, sentence construction, gender, and the number. Now, these are very, very important. Whenever we want to talk about uh, standard language, we take into cognizance these issues we raise. The language will make sure that it complies you know, with the standard. Rosography is also very, very important. We check the spelling, you know, word division, you know, and so on and so forth. And it also entails the sentence construction that has to, because in Alpha language, it involves the use of gender and number, you know, whenever you are talking, whether, whatever you are talking about is living or non living thing. The question of gender and number must have to be there. So this was the main task that we did as far as the uh, reviewing and editing are concerned. Now, to cover the batch of the books, we did them in three batches. Batch one contains 60 decodable and level story books that were reviewed and edited as far as the outline uh, uh, issues under language orthography sentence construction, gender, and number. Batch 2 contains 70 decodable and uh, level story books. They were reviewed and edited. And thirdly, uh, 77 decodable and level story books were reviewed and edited. So collectively, the total number of the books which were reviewed and edited were based on the budget. Uh, the first batch was done. When they finish, they send it to us. We go through and check the language, orthography, sentence construction, gender, and the number. And subsequently, batch two and batch three uh, up to the end. Now, moving to the question of lesson plan from the implementation process. Here, there are two important issues there. One is the little implementation time. That is to say the timing uh, is too short. One would have preferred uh, adequate time, even though we all know that whenever we have uh, work of this nature, we need to have a time frame within which the work you know, must have to be done or accomplished. But certainly, the implementation timing is really very, very little. Perhaps in the future, we may need uh, more timing uh, to make sure that everything uh, has been covered. Uh, secondly, uh, it is a question of inadequate training on the software. We remember that the Bloom was 
something very new for all of us. Uh, I remember we participated in the three stages. First of all, we were also part of the participants who were taught how to work on the Bloom software. At this level, we were acquainted you know, with the mechanics of the Bloom. And then at that level, uh, that was during the first workshop. The second and the third uh, a workshop, we were busy uh, editing the work that has already been done. So the Bloom was entirely new to us, which was very, very interesting. And it was an uh, uh, interesting experience. But the, 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 the training was not really adequate. Uh, also, in that case, one would have really preferred adequate uh, training time for us to master uh, the software. Perhaps uh, the non adequate of the timing of the training, that was really uh, what really caused some of the little uh, mistakes that Grace has indicated you know, in our presentation. But on the whole, the software was very, very interesting, and the experience was really uh, interesting. Now, coming to the recommendations for applications of the enabling writing. Number one, there is a need for building closer synergy with wider government offices in charge of basic education, like the universal, like the state universal basic education board, Quebec, and the National Council for Colleges of Education, NCCE. That is to say, although at a certain point they were really involved, but there is a need, you know, for them to be fully involved especially bearing in mind the role they play as far as education is concerned as a whole, you know, in the country. It is very, very important, especially when we consider UBEC at the national level and SUPEB at the state level. It is very, very important to have, you know, that closer synergy so that subsequently any other thing that will have to be done, you know, can be done uh, collectively. Secondly, the implementation should include a pilot phase where interaction of children with the Bloom books is tested, you know, and reviewed. It is very, very important, bearing in mind that even those who participated in the project had to be trained on how the software was to be used. You know, when coming to the students, they have no idea. So I think it's very, very important, you know, having that. Uh, interaction with the children to see how actually uh, the books are tested, you know, and reviewed. Uh, thirdly, uh, the universities, uh, especially which the uh, outcome of the projects are going to utilize could have been uh, be linked with the more in the sense that most of them, uh, they can be involved in the reading program, especially bearing in mind the role the faculties of education uh, play as facilitators and coordinators of reading centers. That is to say, in some of these universities, we have faculties of education uh, whose role, you know, has to do with facilitation and coordination. So one would have thought they can be involved, they can be linked to the whole program so that, you know, some of the little hitches we might have experienced in the project, you know, can be handled, you know, in the future. Uh, number four, the national policy on education allows children to learn through language and environment. Uh, this will change later to be learning through child's mother tongue. Therefore, uh, any country, for example, that has a similar policy uh, to Nigeria can easily ad adapt this particular uh, project. Uh, the only thing is that they have to change uh, from one language you know, to another because every country must have different languages. In Nigeria, for example, we have you know, over 520 languages. And therefore, if any country wants to replicate this particular project, but certainly it can be done, bearing in mind, you know, the modalities that have already been taken. The only thing is that, you know, the languages will have to be uh, substituted because every country has 
you know, with his own uh, languages. And lastly, uh, in northern Nigeria, there are over at least three key languages. The national, language, uh, the national policy on education allows, like I said, children to learn through the medium of each other. So, for example, the USAID should have at least extended this particular project to be involved with other languages like Pulpunde and Kanuri languages. These are very, very important languages uh, which, are, which can be found or which are found within the same environment with Hausa. Uh, if this is done, that is to say the purpose will really be achieved and then uh, a large area or number can be covered, especially bearing in mind the Pulpunde language and the Kanuri language also, you know, happen to have a very close relationship, you know, with, uh, with Hausa. Lastly, uh, the plan sustainability strategy uh, of this particular project uh, should have include a kind of memorandum of understanding uh, at the onset. That is to say, those bigger organizations, the Ministry of Education, the NES, which are going to support, uh, where we have a memorandum of understanding that will easily facilitate at any given time anything that will really come you know, can just be handled uh, collectively instead of allowing, you know, uh, AUM, for example, to handle it alone. Although the, the, the project was entirely supposed to be handled, but then notwithstanding, if uh, we want to uh, a, a kind of plan of sustainability strategy where we have the memorandum of understanding, that will really help, you know, in facilitating whatever uh, we really want to do. Because together, uh, we can be able uh, to handle the project, you know, successfully. Uh, uh, on the whole, it was a huge success. But notwithstanding some of these uh, observations, uh, if they can be uh, handled, I'm sure, subsequently any project of this nature uh, that will come will really make a huge success. And if, uh, by way of extending, this language is like Kanuri or Pulpuldi, or this very one that has already been done, will be extended, you know, to catch up on some of the observations we mentioned in the presentation of Dr. Grace. I think that will really uh, be very, very interesting. Uh, thank you very much. This is as far as uh, my own observation uh, in the uh, basic, uh, in the three areas that I have participated. That is number one, at the training level. Secondly, as a consultant, the kind of role that I have played. And thirdly, at the presentation level. At the presentation level, like uh, the previous has mentioned, I was part and person, I was there, and then the presentation was made. All the key, uh, all the stakeholders, of uh, the, uh, the federal Ministry of Education, the NERDC, and all of our views were also, present, uh, were also present, and then the work was presented. And then uh, some were anxiously uh, waiting for permission to be given, like the commissioners from the Ministry of Education, to start that particular thing. Uh, thank you very much. Thank uh, you very much, uh, Professor Alisu, yeah. for your feedback. Yeah. And now uh, you have another role to play, to okay. present on behalf of NEDIC Director. Plans from the structured level and the portable book writing program using BIM software, the enabling writing workshop experience in Nigeria, response from NERGC. The response of the uh, NERGC, so that is to say, it has to do with the policy issues, and certainly it is very, very important uh, that we get them to respond. Now, talking about NERGC is a federal agency in charge of the following functions, uh, curriculum development, book development, language development, and educational research, another thing. It is engaged in many uh, educational activities such as policy matters, best practices, innovations in Nigeria. It performs uh, several regulatory and quality assurance duties and responsibilities. Therefore, the role of NRDC as a gateway to innovation and partner to development initiatives. NERDC's partnership are in house EW projects, satellite driven 
and actually because of derivable benefits to education, especially the region initiative that is recording some giants and creating impact. That is to say, any RBC is appreci uh, appreciating being involved in part and parcel of this uh, particular project. Now, the development of 200 levels and the portable EWO project using the Bloom software is a success story and as such must be sustained and scaled up. This can be achieved through the following. One, mass produce of the books and be made easily accessible to learners, especially for reading and other lessons in both urban, rural, and other difficult uh, to, to reach areas. I think this is very, very important. Although the target, you know, was 200, I'm sure more and more can be produced and then we can be able to reach all the nooks and corners of the environment. Secondly, is the question of involvement of sister educational agencies, particularly the Universal Basic Education Commission, the BEP, at the federal level, to support the production, distribution of the materials in the relevant state. This is very, very important. The UBEC is at the federal level and is controlled the SUBEC at the state level. Therefore, if this arrangement is made, uh, it simply means instruction will be made to the state at the state level so that the production of these books can be made, you know, and then the distribution can equally be handled. I remember the uh, Commission of Education, Sokoto State, was anxiously uh, asking for permission to go ahead even prior, you know, to the permission from the uh, from the UBEC. So mm -hmm. it's very, very important. Thirdly, partnership involving NARDC, UBEC, State Universal Education Boards, that is fair, and development partners to build the capacity of teachers to produce more materials and use them effectively as instructional resources is very, very important. This is because the realization of the importance and usefulness of the decodable readers, literacy, and reading is of paramount importance. Number five, so now we move to the less uh, land concern and effective means of covering the space and narrowing the gap created by shortage of gas or reading materials. That is to say, the availability of these books will really help in minimizing the kind of problem that we have been having as far as the acute shortage of books is concerned. And it will really facilitate in the reading activities of the children at different levels. Enable, it also enables an opportunity to build the capacity of practitioners strengthening the institutional capacity. So it is going to be a two-way traffic. That is to say, uh, the opportunity building the capacity of uh, practitioners and at the same time strengthening the instructional uh, capacity. So together that will be an added advantage. Now provided, uh, it will also provide an opportunity for the introduction of a global best practices and thus opening the gates more widely for Nigeria into the global community, uh, community of practice and for the community knowing that it now has really happened. And this is also is going to be an advantage uh, to Nigeria by the time uh, this particular opportunity uh, is properly utilized. So it is important and useful to replicate this EWO and other reading projects in other countries. It is very, very important. Just like I said in my own comments, that it is very, very important and it is easy for that replication to be done in other countries, provided you know the pattern being utilized or being done in Nigeria can be adopted. The only thing is the question of uh, switching over to the different languages because the languages that are found in Nigeria are not the same in other countries. To any country that will want to adopt this particular thing, it is a question of utilizing you know the uh, the, the criteria used by Nigeria. Especially bearing in mind that in Nigeria uh, we use the mother tongue at those levels, just like uh, it has been explained uh, by Grace in her presentation. However, considering the linguistic terrain 
and the population of Nigeria, NERGC asserts strongly that a replication of the project to cover certain identified languages domestically will be a bright and rewarding initiative. Just like I said in my own presentation, it's very, very important if, you know, the, the project can be extended to other languages closer. We started with Hausa now. I, I have suggested Kanuri and Pulpude, and now any RGC is suggesting uh, other languages can be identified so that the whole project can be domestically uh, domesticated so that a bright and wide initiative, you know, with the coming of other uh, particular languages on board. The interesting thing is that now that it has been done in the case of Hausa, so many other related languages will be anxious to be part and parcel. Uh, I'm sure uh, by the time the project was going on, there are other languages that ought to have been involved, but then there is a limit to what can be done at a time, time frame and so on and so forth. So in, in the case of Hausa, it has already taken place, and now we are suggesting that uh, that can be extended, you know, to other languages. And gradually, because the most important thing has already been done, it can be extended, you know, to other languages, especially bearing in mind that in Nigeria we have over 500, you know, and 20 languages. We are not saying all the 520 must have to be covered, but gradually, you know, those uh, closely uh, related to Hausa can be uh, benefited, and then eventually uh, the whole a project can be uh, properly uh, utilized. Well, I think uh, that is all uh, for the uh, contribution or input from the NERDC. Uh, thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much, Professor Salisu, uh, for representing NEDIC in such a wonderful way. Uh, we felt that we had Dr. Gandu with us. So thank you very much for thank you very much. Uh, the two presentations. And now we are going back to question and answer session. Our time uh, was not for review and editing, for example, per a book. I don't think we did timing per book as such. What we did was after every workshop, the number of books produced at that workshop, I first go to the M&E team, and then they go through it with the, with the um, going through the forms that have been filled by the, by the writers, that took weeks, actually. I think for the first, uh, no, I, I, I can't give time, but I know that we, the, like we, the first batch of books that were given to them from the first workshop, it took about two weeks to get those um, through the M&E uh, uh, process, the first review, and then the same thing goes to the, um, for the writer trainer review, and then for the Hausa uh, Hausa expert review, the books were sent to them in their location. So I've, I'm not able to quantify in terms of time, yeah, but me, I can say that. Yes, go ahead. Okay, I just want to say, just like I mentioned, you know, the review was done in batches. That is to say. You know, a certain number, when a certain number is done, then it is sent to us. You know, while we wait for the coming of other batches, then we continue to work on the first batch that was sent. That was the reason why we said initially we had 16, then 70, then another 77, batch 1, batch 2, and batch 3. Dr. Limo, are we communicating? Thank you, yes. thank you, thank you for... Yes. For I don't know if I yeah, so I'm not sure we can say each book took so such a such a number of hours because we didn't quantify in terms of hours, but if we divide we can get it. If if we can <laughs> maybe sit down and divide, we might be able to come up with something. But right now we can say this is the specific time it takes to review a book through all the three stages. Okay. Thank you. And we have another question here. I, I'm not sure if it was covered, but he's asking, were artists on site during the workshop to supply illustrations, if uh, appropriate? No, we didn't it's have great. artists. For the, for the EW Nigeria, we didn't invite artists on, on site to, uh, to review uh, 
to, to uh, illustrate books as they were being written. We didn't do that. We, we, we did the review after we, have, uh, we, we had um, edited the books, after we said this, this is the final version of the book we want, that was when we sent for illustrations. Those that needed illustrations um, changed. Okay. And there is another question to you, Dr. Grace, asking question to Dr. Grace. Can you please summarize again the three steps of systematic book review? Okay. So we had three stages of systematic book review. The first is the monitoring and evaluation team. And their focus actually was to make sure that we're meeting the specified guidelines in terms of content, in terms of inclusion, in terms of um, the, yes, in terms of context, content, equity, uh, gender, inclusion, so those kind of things, and then making sure that we're following the, the, the um, laid down patterns in terms of uh, information text and then narrative. So that was what they did. They made sure we followed specified guidelines in terms of what should be the content. Then the second stage in the review is the one that is done by the writing trainer and the project team. And what that focused on was making sure that we were, the focus of that one was making sure that we were meeting uh, guiding document uh, specifications. So are sentences according to the number of words specified, are the um, do we have words that are not supposed to, that are going are above that level? So those those ones were concerned about in terms of the how far the book has met the, the guiding document that um, are appropriate to that level in terms of if it's decodable, are we sticking to the decodable the, that particular stage of the decodable? If it's a leveled book, is it meeting all the criteria for a level two book? And so that one that's why we said that one was done on Bloom. But the first one was done on the, on the hard copies, but when it came to the writing trainer uh, review, that one was done in blue because we, let, we needed to make sure that the books were meeting the, the guiding guidelines set out on blue. And then the third one was the one that we, after we had done all that, we printed the books again, and that's the one that was, that's the third stage that was sent to Professor Yakase and his colleagues and they went through what he said, orthography, uh, sentence structure, and then making sure that the language um, is standard. So that, those are the three uh, stages in the review that took place. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you very much. much. Uh, the time is running, running short of time. Uh, we still have some questions to be answered, but uh, unfortunately, we will not be able to answer them all here. So, as I mentioned before, we will uh, uh, provide uh, answers for the questions which we didn't answer online, and we will report them in the GRN website and blog for those who have asked and others to get the answers for these questions. Uh, so uh, I would like to take, to take this time to thank you all, our participants and pre presenters for being part of this webinar. And uh, we really appreciate your time because we are used to one hour webinar, but this was 90 minutes webinar uh, because it had a lot of things to be covered, taking into account also the the, that we wanted to hear the lessons learned from Nigeria so that when we, we plan for another project of this kind, we know that how we navigate through it. So once again, thank you very much for attending. And uh, we are working to bring you another webinar in December, so please stay tuned. Uh, Dr. Grace, Adoliman, Professor Salis, Thank you very much, and uh, yeah, have you. a good, good afternoon. Have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Yes, congratulations.